I am going to talk about the rising tide of big data and try to do some swimming lessons because we don't want to focus on the problems here. Uh, I am in the School of Information Management, um, and so that, that's really where people, information, and technology come together, and that's why that's my passion. Let's start with the obvious, what is big data? There's a lot of definitions for big data. There's as many definitions for big data uh, as there are people to trying to tell you, sell you something about big data. The, the, the textbook definition is volume, variety, and velocity. Lots of data, lots of different aspects to that data, uh, and it's coming at you faster and faster and faster, so it's accumulating really rapidly. But, I mean, really, big data is anything more than I can handle. If I'm used to handling 40,000 rows in a spreadsheet and you give me 3 million, that's big data to me. If I'm used to handling 10 million rows of data uh, and you give me 1,000 petabytes of data, that's big data to me, right? So it's really a relative thing of your comfort level of working with data and, and moving beyond that. Um, there's some other definitions, data too large to be contained by a single computer, data beyond human scale, you can put measurements on it. The most common definition that you will actually encounter in day-to-day -day life is the last one, anything that someone thinks they can sell you by claiming <laughs> it is big data, that is the impractice definition of big data. Uh, to me though, uh, I think before we start talking about what is big data and what do you do about it, you have to ask the larger question, which is why is big data? Which I know isn't a grammatically correct sentence. You'll, you'll pardon me for that, I hope. Why is big data? How did we get to a point where everyone is trying to sell you something by claiming that it is big data? I boiled it down to six reasons. The first is Web 2.0 turned everyone into content creators. And I have a brief video here. I hope. Yes. Uh, I have a brief video here um, of the internet in real time, which estimates the number uh, of pieces of information coming from each of these social media services. And since I've started this thing in 10 seconds, there's been 68,000 tweets. There have been 324,000 minutes used on Skype. There have been 7,000 hours watched on Netflix. Facebook has generated 132 gigabytes of data, um, 16,000 app downloads. You can look at them all, right? There is a massive amount of data, and we are creating it. We moved past this paradigm where it was a select number of people who created data and have moved into a world where we're all creating data all of the time. And, and we think that there's some value there. I'm not sure of those 250,000 tweets, how many of them have actual value. Um, but we, we do believe that somewhere in that mess, there is something worth looking at, and so we keep it all. Library of Congress in the first few years of Twitter was like, yeah, we're gonna archive every single tweet. <laughs> And then they started reading some of them, and they were like, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> so we have moved beyond that. Uh, the, the second reason, though, you know, that's kind of an older thing. The second reason is that the Internet of Things has turned everything into a content creator. I'm sorry, I'm probably trying to move the slides ahead while you're trying to switch them, aren't I? All right, we're good. Um, the Internet of Things is all of these devices are now network ready, and they're sending data to us at, at shocking intervals. So a light bulb can be controlled from your smartphone, and it's emitting data all the time. I'm not on. 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 I'm on at 33% of brightness. I'm off again. I'm on. I'm, you know, and, and how much value is there to that data? I don't know yet, but we're, we're collecting it all, right? And I can control my garage door with my phone, and so my phone gets updates every time my garage door opens and closes, which, when my two-year-old is driving, uh, will probably be very valuable for me to have, but at the moment uh, is somewhat uh, less useful. So people and things are creating data. The third reason, though, is that data accumulation is less visible than it used to be. There was a time where when you had a lot of data, you could tell because you were living and working in a fire hazard, right? But now, the same amount of data is there, it's just sitting in those computers. So we have moved from this place where the data accumulation is visible to where it's invisible. When I talk about data management, I like to show you this slide. This is what good data management looks like. This slide, however, is what bad data management looks like, right? It's, it's just data, it's just ones and zeros. It's the, exact, it's the exact same thing from the outside. And so we can hide our, our data away. The fourth reason, which I think people talk about more, is the declining price of storage, right? If you look at this graph, 
Uh, it's, a log, it's a straight line on a logarithmic scale, which means that it is a true exponential decline in the price of hard drives. We've gone from 1980 when it was a million dollars for a gigabyte of data, if you could buy a gigabyte of data, which you couldn't, um, to today where it's three cents per gigabyte of data, right? All of a sudden I can keep a gigabyte of data around for three cents for the life of that hard drive which as we know is somewhere between one day and 10 years and you have no idea how long. <laughs> but uh, I can keep it around, right? It's relatively inexpensive. The fifth reason, cloud storage. All of a sudden it wasn't enough to have cheap storage in my house, now I wanted to have cheap storage in the cloud. And I'm paying as I go, which means, you know, before the cloud, every time I filled a hard drive, I faced this decision point of, oh, I filled up my hard drive. Do I delete some data or do I go out and buy a new hard drive? Often I would choose to go out and buy a new hard drive, let's be honest, but I was forced to make that decision. The way the cloud works is you just keep adding. You have another piece of data, add it to the cloud, it's no problem. You'll pay for it and so your costs continue to grow of your, for your cloud storage, um, but you never face this decision point of, you know, listen, five years ago you were spending $100 a month on the cloud and you thought that was a good thing and great cost savings. Now you're spending 10,000. Do you have an additional $9,900 worth of valuable data or are your costs continuing to spiral out of control and you're just not facing uh, that reality? And the sixth and final reason is the faint lingering hope of actually finding valuable information, <laughs> right? You know, if we were convinced that this data was garbage, we would just throw it out. Right? But we, we, we are the hoarders in the worst way and we're saying, I cannot throw out that data because one day, one day, I will find something to do with it. I swear I will. Listen, honey, I know that I'm keeping an old McDonald's cup on my office desk, but what if one day I need a place to put my pens? That is what we are saying about our data. And so there's a dollar sign in there somewhere because we think that there is value in our data and so we do try to keep it around. And so as I reflect on these six reasons, and we could talk about more and talk about other things that fit in them, but as I think about these six reasons, the answer to the question of why do we have big data is really because we can. <laughs> because it's cheap and because we, we can keep it around. If we couldn't keep it around, we wouldn't. And, and so when you try to define big data, I think it's really, really important that you acknowledge that big data is a problem and not a solution. We tend to talk about big data as a solution, and it's funny when you replace big data as a solution with big data as a problem, how things sound. Your uh, CEO comes into your office and says, we need to do big data immediately. He's really saying you need to do problems immediately and you <laughs> should really reply and say, that's the job of management, not me. Um, when, you, when someone comes and says, I have a product that will help you adopt big data in your organization, you're adopting problems, right? So when you talk about big data as a concept, it's a problem and not a solution. So thanks for having me. It's been a, a great time here with you. Uh, no, I'll talk a little bit more uh, about what I think some of the solutions are um, for data. And I do think the first thing is to admit that you have a problem and, and to talk about big data as being a problem. I don't mind the casual language of saying that we're going to use big data because it's going to bring value to our company. I, I don't mind that. But you do have to say it with the understanding that big data by itself is a problem. And it becomes a solution. It becomes something that's valuable only when you're doing something about the big data, when you are actually finding that value in the data. Otherwise, it's a liability. So admitting you have a problem is important. Sticking together, and sticking together has a lot of different connotations to it um, in, in the context of big data, but what I mean is um, to the extent, to some extent we compete with others, but there is a point at which we have to start working together. And, and one way, oh, I've lost my, my ocean slide, that's fine. Uh, one way that I'm doing it on the ocean data management side uh, is we're taking all of these ocean research institutions across the country that are collecting rich and vibrant, economically relevant, uh, ecosystem relevant data from across Canada's three oceans um, and not sharing it together in any meaningful way. And saying that we need to work together as a group to figure out how we're going to grapple with this growing amount of information so that we can find the value in the data that we're collecting. 
Uh, I think um, that participation in organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, like other organizations you may be a part of, where there's the capacity and the ability to get together and say, listen, we all have this big data problem, let's try to tackle it together, uh, I think is really important. Because one of the ways that we've adopted over the years of dealing with large scale things um, is essentially uh, to throw multiple solutions at the problem, to crowdsource it essentially and say, I can't solve this on my own, but if I get a thousand of us together, a hundred of us together, or ten of us together, maybe we have a chance. I think that we need to ascend the pyramid. So when we talk about the different kinds of data in the world, uh, we start at lowest level of data, but from data we can extract information, and from information we can extract knowledge, and from knowledge we hope to God one day we find wisdom, right? Um, Data, moving big data um, into something that's of value means ascending, getting out of the big data level and saying, I'm going to find the information in my big data. I'm going to extract the knowledge from my big data. And we talk about analytics. We talk about self-serve business intelligence. We talk about all sorts of different terms. But really what we mean is we have to move past this data, which doesn't work at human scale. And what's human scale? You know what humans are really, really good at? They're 10 fingers. If it's not something, you know, that's why we talk about percentages, right? 90%, 70%, we understand that intuitively. Once you move past 10, we start to get a lot worse at dealing with numbers and with dealing with quantities. So how do you get massive amounts of big data into information that I can, that I can put my fingers around and that I can understand using the limits of our fairly basic human brains? They're better than computers, though. Don't let me try to tell you that robot, robots are smarter than humans, at least not yet. Uh, so there are some commercial tools that help you do this, right? Tableau, SAP, IBM Watson Analytics. We use these in our research. We teach these in our teaching. Uh, the modern graduate, uh, at least from a business program at Dow, and I'm sure other business programs and other computer science programs, are learning these tools. And these tools are fundamentally about helping you ascend the pyramid from data to information and knowledge. We also can do this at a custom level. So we had a really interesting project where we worked with Nova Scotia Environment, the Institute for Big Data Analytics, and the Faculty of Computer Science, and the Chronicle Herald to take 25 years of newspaper articles, the text, the combined intellectual property from the past two and a half decades from the Chronicle Herald, and say, what articles talked about floods? And let's geolocate those articles to say where they happened in Nova Scotia, and now we have a data set of where have floods been happening in Nova Scotia, which is useful for realty reasons, for insurance reasons, for urban planning reasons, for managing ecosystem reason, regions. And it's not perfect because we're extracting it from really messy data. But we've gone from something that's large and messy and sitting down and reading all of those newspapers would take a really long time. And in the space of a couple of months, we have that nice data set and a nice interface. Remaining calm and finding strength through education. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, we invited a professor and he's going to rant at us about education. Sorry, before I was a professor, I ranted. Now I offer insights. Uh, <laughs> strength through education. And I'm not trying to sell you on university education. I'm not trying to sell you on Dalhousie University. I'm not even trying to sell you on executive education. Sorry, Deb. What I'm saying is... Um, what we need is to understand data better than we do right now as individuals and as a society. And I think that there's a lot of ways that this happens. And yes, um, I believe firmly in the program that Deb was talking about for training about big data, but there are many others. And my advice would be to find one of them and embrace it. Because when we show these graphs about the people who we need to deal with data and the current economy, this is a report um, by McKinsey Global Institute predicting um, the skills gap in the U.S., and there's similar Canadian data, just divide by 10 as usual. Um, <laughs> the usual way, if you see U.S. numbers, divide them by 10. It works like 80% of the time, 80-20 rule. Um, what they say is 465,000 positions will be available, and we'll have a workforce of 300,000 to fill those positions. We're going to need 165,000 additional people with deep analytics, with this ability to do data science, to gather data and extract these insights and, and to, to, to manage the, the scale and scope of data that we're talking about. And, and that's important. But I actually, that's not the problem that I'm passionate about. The next paragraph in the McKinsey Report says there is another kind of data knowledge, which I call data literacy, which they call data savvy. I don't know where the dollar signs are coming from or the percent signs. I only have three degrees in computer science. I can't be expected to make PowerPoint work. <laughs> Um, 
And what they say is that these data savvy people, the data who, the people who can make decisions based on sound uh, analysis of data, the people who can visualize data, the people who can use data in their everyday jobs, there's going to be 4 million positions that need that. And this report is three years old. I bet if they did it today, there'd be more. But they came up with a number of 4 million and a workforce of 2.5 million, right? It's a 1.5 million trained person deficit. And that's the space. If you hear someone say big data, you might think, I could never do big data. That's not what I do. And you don't have to. But you do have to be prepared to operate in a world where this is happening. And we're not doing big data. Big data is happening to us. And, and I believe that the preparation to operate in that world is this idea of being data savvy, of being data literate. And so we put together this report on strategies and best practices for data literacy education. Uh, and this um, executive education program is informed by that. But we're also incorporating it into our undergraduate teaching and our graduate level teaching that we need to help students understand when they're learning about data and be able to apply these skills in other domains. Because we teach a lot of this stuff in universities already and have for a long time, but students aren't talking about it like a transferable skill, which it is. And so it's the ability to create, comprehend, and communicate data, collecting, managing, evaluating, and applying data in a critical manner. And we think it, it spans sectors, universities, everywhere. We, we think it's really important. Uh, and that's, that, this is what underscores my thing about we need to help people be ready to operate in a data-intensive knowledge economy. The final thing that I have to say about working with big data uh, in the very short amount of time we have to tackle this large subject is there is no substitute for human attention, right? If you go back to that Chronicle Herald flood database, that's not as accurate as me reading all of those newspapers. But what do you do when you have too much data and not enough humans. This is what we're trying to, to grapple with when we're trying to ascend this data information knowledge wisdom pyramid is how do we do it when we don't have enough people to deal with the scale of data that we're talking about. There, there's some basic ways, right? This, this is the point where when you upload a file, it will automatically sort it for you. This is the basic level of Let's just stop people from dumping all their files on the same shared drive and hoping that one day someone will be able to find them back, maybe. Which is too often the information management practice uh, that we see happening. And, and so tools like SharePoint are developing these abilities to say, we know that not everyone is going to add the right metadata to their files, but maybe we can make sense of it anyway. It's what Google did with the web, right? The original, the original days of search engines, there are all sorts of rules about what kind of information you had to put on your website for it to show up in search results, and that will help. But Google said, you know what, we're not going to require people to do that. We're just going to figure it out without them. And, and that's the, 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 the trend that technology is following. Google's knowledge graph is an example of this. Um, you've probably never seen this picture, but you may have seen something like this, where when you type search results, you get this information on the side. That wasn't put there manually by a person. This is Google extracting the semantics. So they've gone beyond keywords to say, what are the topics of conversation? What are, what are the things that are being discussed in this document? Which is vital to managing the large scale of documents that you might be grappling with. Uh, and so this is an example of where they've put a bio there. And at the bottom, they have a whole bunch of people uh, that are also searched for by the people who are searching for Marie Curie that you may be interested in. And they're trying to build this understanding that's a level above bash in the word that you're interested in and hope that what you're looking for comes up. And the other thing that you may have heard of um, is the IBM Watson approach. Cognitive computing is the word that they're using for it. There's a lot of words for it. But the idea is using computers to do the large scale stuff and bring it down to a scale that humans can work with. And they did this when they competed on Jeopardy and won, um, including answering questions that were puns or that had particular meaning. That's not something computers have been able to do ever. And we're entering into what they call the cognitive era. Again, that's marketing. But there is something happening here. And the fact that they want to own the word is not something that I fault them for. There's something happening here where we're asking computers to do more and more. So one of the things that they'll allow you to do uh, is assess the emotions in a particular document. Anyone want to guess what document I assessed that had a small amount of anger and a large amount of disgust? Donald Trump. Well done. <laughs> I threw a Donald Trump speech in there 
uh, and he's analytical and confident and not very tentative. He's disgusted, and you can actually do this at the sentence level. Oh, there's also some social stuff there. He is not open or conscientious. He is an extrovert, he's agreeable, and he has a vast emotional range, which I think is diagnosable under DSM-5, but anyway, um, not, the goal of this is not to, uh, to, to bash Donald Trump. That's another talk. Um, you can also do it at the sentence level, and you can say, um, what are the sentences that show the most disgust, right? Um, they're politicians, they're all talk, they're no action. I'm impressed that a computer can see something like that and rate it as being disgusted. Uh, I think that that's probably a fairly accurate uh, assessment of those five emotions. The other thing that you could do is you can give it vast amounts of text and it can actually build personality portraits of people. So the same Donald Trump speech, which was delivered in South Carolina, um, they come up with this summary of you're likely to reply on social media by eco-friendly, which surprised me a little bit, um, and put your health at risk, which doesn't really jive with the second one, but anyway, um, and you're not likely to click on an ad. Oh, sorry, yeah. You're unlikely to click on an ad, follow on social media, or buy healthy foods, which, uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, you can also split it out into a personality profile, which I won't go into detail, but it tries to extract something, some understanding of the personality of the person that you're working with, and they're saying you can use this to interact with customers. You can use this to assess the information that's coming into you from social media. You can use this to assess this unstructured vast amount of text in the world. Is it a magic bullet? No. Um, in fact, when I try to classify my daughter, they have an image classifier. Their number one guess is that she's a mug, which seems uh, a bit off. Uh, their other guesses are pretty good, right? Child, dancing, celebration, performing, that's really accurate when all I gave them was an image. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, mug is wrong. <laughs> and, and so we have to understand that there is no substitute for human attention, that computers can do a lot of this, but at the end of the day, for the time being at least, we still have to keep checking up on them. And that is going to require people who understand the data, who understand how data analysis work. They don't need to be able to walk in and do data science, but they need this kind of understanding. That's my brief rant, sorry, set of insights about big data. Uh, I welcome your questions, discussion, and you can reach me at these places if uh, you have other questions to talk about later.